might be difficult for y'all to tell, but looking out at this ocean, it's probably about 20, 30 foot visibility, which means with the underwater fishing rod, we can fish and see everything that bites. This is so exciting, and I'm gonna show you everything you need to try to do this yourself with a friend. You know, one of the very first things you should do when you come out here trying to do this is actually don't plan to do this. Plan to go fishing instead with the rod and reel because you just don't know how murky it's gonna be and it's gonna be no fun. Luckily today, the swell has been low, about three feet for the last three days. And when the swell is low and calm and the wind is low and calm, then it gives all the debris a chance to settle. And right now, it is gin clear. Really, all you need, some fins, a wetsuit, if your wetsuit doesn't have a hood, get a hood, some socks to put your fins all over, and the fishing rod, that's really it. So this is great for spear fishermen who are a little too old, maybe they think they don't feel comfortable going out anymore, or even if you never dove before and you just want to swim around and snorkel, now you can have a fishing rod, go out and catch a PB lingcod, just like that, from underwater. All right, we're gonna get this rope tied up here so we can go down and have something to hold on to. Always stay safe. All right, y'all, here we go. So now that you're going down to a place like this, you can fish in the places where you can't cast to from shore. It's about to go down, y'all. It's about to go down. See that big rock out there? There's no way anybody from shore can cast to that big rock, and I bet you it just drops straight down. Last time I tried this, I used my short fins. Today I've got the long ones. This is gonna help me get around a lot easier. And today I've also got this open cell wetsuit. Last time I was using a closed cell neoprene scuba suit. Difference between that and this is inside here, it's, it's an open cell, so what that means is there's no protective layer on it. This will stick to your skin really tight, keep you nice and warm, keep you dry too if you get a good fitting one. This is a large, long. The only difficult thing about having these types of wetsuits is that they're really sticky. So in order to put it on, put some uh, water mixed with hair conditioner, get it all wet and lubricated inside, then you can slip right on. Or you can use the salt water just get it wet and you'll slip right in. So going in, first time using this, hopefully it works well. We're gonna be fishing swim baits and jigs. That's a big old swim bait. That's a nice color swim bait. And I've had a lot of luck with that one. That's the Gus's Tackle Special. So three big swim baits on two ounce or three ounce weights. We can just jig it up and down when we get out to the deep water. Man, I better get out there. Um, this is, this wetsuit's feeling nice catch some fish, put them in the bag. This is the second time that I've ever tried this underwater snorkel fishing and it was the perfect day to do it because we had 30 foot visibility. Now the thing that I'm trying to target is around all the boulders, around the big rocks because that's where these fish are going to be hanging out. They're going to have their little eyes poking out and if they see something they're going to come out and bite it. Now if you look at the top of the screen where that jig is, a fish, a black and yellow, you see that fish come right out and inspect it. it takes a nip at it and I try to set the hook. Now at this point, I'm already trying to, I'm actually already figuring out a pattern. Did you see that black and yellow come out of nowhere? But I think I've got it down. These smaller rockfish, they're not biting at the jig itself. 
they're biting at the little tassel on the hook. So this is a pattern we're going to see. I catch a bunch of these. This is the first black and yellow of the day. Now these are venomous, so I'm handling it very carefully. I am not trying to get poked. And look how it swims down. That's another thing I noticed. It just flutters down and just starts swimming real slow. Now I start having a little fun. I cast out this little tiny M rod. <laughs> Did you see that little bull kelp behind me? That thing spooked me because I felt something hit my leg. I turned around and it was the bull kelp. But here we go again. Did you see that? That was the black and yellow. He followed the jig up and he bit it. And this is something when you're fishing from shore, you cover a lot of ground, you get the attention of a lot of fish, and this just proves that they will follow your bait and they'll bite it when they have the opportunity. And again, look how that fish swims. It doesn't even swim, it just floats down and it doesn't even flutter. And my theory on that is because they don't want to be noticed by a lingcod and become live bait sandwich. Now I cast out again and I'm jigging this exactly how I would do it if I were from shore. Keeping it near the bottom, small little jigs, and trying to get the attention of any fish who want to follow it. And what do you know, there comes one following it immediately, chases it, and now I know I've got his attention. So I'm keeping it in front of him. And did you see how he bit at the hook? Now look at this hook. It's got this little shiny tassel on it. Every single one of the fishermen's life jiggy jigs has this tassel on it. So if you want to buy one, this is going to increase your chance of getting fish exponentially. And did you see that fish swim down again, just floating down? But that little tassel, that's the trick. That gets their, their attention and the fish bite at the hook exactly where you want. Now through all this, when I'm casting out, I just can't help but imagine someone from shore watching this guy out there with this little tiny rod coming up every once in a while and casting, maybe catching a fish. But I'm doing the same thing, casting, bringing it back, and you see that long line, that's a big crevice that I'm trying to get this little jig into. Now it's about to fall into the crevice, and once it does, my plan is just to jig it there a few times. But look, it falls in there, and almost immediately it gets the attention of a cabazon. Now it's so cool that I'm actually underwater seeing this live in person and I could see what these rockfish bite on and what they like to, to eat. And the cabazon, they act a lot like the rockfish, except they're more aggressive. In a clip coming up, you're going to see a kelp greenling and a cabazon are very close to the same bait. But the cabazon, I believe, is higher on the food chain and it takes dominance over it. So this was my little anchor an old ab iron attached to a float line. On the float line, I had a mesh lobster bag and I kept some swim baits, kept my knife in there, kept a water bottle in case I got hungry, uh, thirsty I mean, but I'm on the hunt for bigger fish now. So drop, look how deep it is too. That's about 30 foot visibility. Oh yeah, those jiggy jigs, stickers, hats, beanies, caps, sweaters, you can all get them at fishermanslife.net. So here we go again, start jigging at this hole. Now, f first, oh here, there we go. Did you see that? That was a kelp greenling that came down from the top. Watch again. So the kelp greenling sees the jig, he wants to get it, and then he probably notices that cabazon come out of nowhere, and he's like, oh, I'm out of here. And that cabazon, that's the fish that's fighting for this jig now. He's trying to, trying to eat, he's up higher on the food chain. Just, just watch this. This is amazing footage. And this is about 15 feet below me. Just jiggling it here and there. I know I've got his attention. Just trying to trying to entice a bite. He bites it several times. But I miss him. Now the cab's on. He's not going for that little tassel. He's going for the jig. They're more predator fish and they want bigger food. Several times he bites at it, but I just I just don't get it. So I try something different. About five times he missed it. So the next time he gets it, I let him take it. He's got it in his mouth and he turns and he repositions it in his mouth. 
that's when we set the hook. So if you're fishing from shore and you feel that bite, don't set the hook immediately. I've said that many times in my videos. You just feel that weight, reel down to it, and then set the hook. So this kind of confirms that too. They'll bite it, reposition it, bring it back to the hole. And this Cabazon probably thought that was a little crab or something. I'm not quite sure, but he swims down fast, not like a rockfish. Now, this was cool. This was a kelp greenling that, see how he, he just jumps at it. He's very aggressive, but these kelp greenlings mouths are very small, but they roam around a lot more freely than the rockfish. They're kind of like the lingcod. They, they swim around and they're not afraid to, to get out of their holes. But this might be pushing it for him because he's far away from his home now. And he's probably thinking to himself, I'm getting the attention of some lingcod who might have me for breakfast. So he gives up, he loses interest. I let him swim down. I kind of lose interest too, just to kelp greenling. Let's 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 look for brighter pastures. <laughs> oh man, what a day! This was amazing. How clear and comfortable I was in this new wetsuit. It helps so much to have a comfortable wetsuit. Man, let me tell you, this is the first time that I've been in the water where I've taken seasickness medicine and it has made all the difference. I might stay out here until it gets dark. It is just like Disneyland down there. I've caught enough fish with the jig. Now let's tie on the big swim bait. So nice out here. Get some friends and do this. I'm, if it's legal, if it's legal. I'm just as excited now to get back in as I was when I first started. We're going to the deeper water. It's still clear over there. It's 60 foot viz. So when I dive in this time, I'm immediately surrounded by a school of anchovy and they circle me like a halo and they follow me as I swim. That was the most like a seal I've ever felt. But that was even a cool experience right there. So this is about a three ounce jig head with a seven inch swim bait. And I'm trying to find the ledges now. Casting over there, because sometimes the current is a little strong and you can't just drop it straight down. So casting helps a lot. And I know there's a giant drop off and I'm just, that's what I'm targeting. Just targeting these big rocks, hoping a big lingcod is down there and I catch his attention. But one thing I found with the lingcod, they are a lot more spontaneous and they're unpredictable at times. I'm just, just swimming around and and honestly, after about 20 minutes of no bites with this big jig head, I'm thinking about switching back to the little jig. And believe it or not, this is about 50 feet. That visibility was that clear. If I was able to dive down, you would see things crystal clear. But you know, there I am just pretty much pocket fishing underwater, jigging in the holes, jigging in all the crevices that I see but no takers, no takers yet. But what you're about to see, that was the highlight of the trip. Now, if you look, there's a huge rock face. You see that huge rock face? That thing is straight up and down. Exactly what I expected. See that big rock out there? There's no way anybody from shore can cast to that big rock and I bet you it just drops straight down. Now right next to that rock face there's a deep valley and I believe the current just goes in and out of there and it carved this deep deep hole. So I cast into the valley and see how I'm using mono, monofilament which floats but immediately I feel a bite. Let's try, I try to set the hook and there we go our first lingcod underwater fishing followed by his friend, who's about to get it in a minute. His friend goes away. It's a beautiful, beautiful lingcod. And what's really cool about this type of fishing, you don't hurt the fish at all, really. You don't get him out of the water. You're not taking out the slime. You can see how he swims. Another really cool thing is once you hold them, a lot of the times they become extremely docile. I'm not sure why that is, but they hardly fight underwater when you hold them. Now, yeah, I'm trying to keep 
some fish today. So I'm trying to measure them. These lingcod, they need to be 22 inches to keep. And with my calculation, that's about 20 inches. So a little small, but still amazing. And one theory I have why they stay calm when you hold them, maybe they don't want to appear more like prey. So they just wait for their opportunity to, to get away and, and, and then and he goes. He just just dives down. Just look at him fall. Amazing. So cool. That followed by another little fish. This was so fun. This was another time I was like, oh man, anybody seeing me casting up here must think I'm crazy. So, boom! You, you can cast good 20, 30, 40 feet casting into the abyss. As I let it sink, that line is floating. I'll probably use braid next time. And I'm just trying to feel any sign of resistance. Start jigging it a little bit. And there, the line goes slack. I think I might have a bite. So I reel in. There's a bite. Yeah, there's a little resistance. There it is again. And th there it is again. Definitely a bite. He bites it again. Now I've got the jig, the swim bait above him. So he's not coming up any further. So I open the bale and he swims down and attacks it. And I get him. I set the hook hard so it doesn't go. But watch when I, when I open the bale, he follows it down. And that this is what supports my theory on the other fish not swimming down fast because that entices a strike from the lingcod. If it just floated down, maybe it wouldn't. But this was a monster. I almost knew. I knew almost immediately that this was a keeper. And how one one way how I tell is just how fat he looks around his neck, right behind his head. You can tell there's a lot of meat there. This is a big lingcod. It's a monster. I'm so excited at this point. I'm just floating here in the deep water with this lingcod swimming around, I'm trying to make sure that I've got a good hook set. But one thing that I do notice. On my line, there's a little fray about two inches above the line that kind of worries me. I think it might just break off. So it's very, very important. Always check your lines for frays. Because if you have one, you know, you could you could lose a fish like this. And even worse, the fish will have a big hook in his mouth and might not survive. But yeah, I just wanted to get a nice, nice image of the ling cod and the little rod. I'm keeping this one. This one's definitely a keeper. So I'm bringing it back, checking if it's a male or not. Yep, it's a male. So, no babies in this one. Bringing it back to the bag. Oh gosh, this was so fun. This was so fun. Yep, now my battery is running out of, it's almost out of batteries and it actually did shut off. So, back to shore I went and changed things out. Oh gosh, yeah, over here my microphone wasn't working, so I'm basically saying that I'm about to go catch some black and blue rockfish because I saw a big school of them out there, and I'm going to change from the big jig to the little jiggy jig. I've got several colors, blue, green, greenling, and silver, but I'm also talking about how comfortable the wetsuit is and how important it is to have a wetsuit that fits. All right, about to go slay a few black rockfish, got the new jig tied on, but man, really, I could see this becoming a new sport. Like, why wouldn't a few people come out here together, some friends, jig up a few fish, have a great time, like, get in the water, be one with nature? There's, oh my gosh, this is just so cool. It's like, it's like a new sport, underwater fishing. Underwater fishing, baby. Snorkel fishing, that's what we'll call it. We're going snorkel fishing today. Yep, we're going snorkel fishing today. So, start things off again. As I go out to look for a black or blue, I see a little black and yellow and test my theory again, and it works immediately. He goes for the little tassel. And now at this point, these guys are almost a nuisance. So I just, you know, I could have a limit of these things if I wanted to. They're all over the place. And see the blacks and blues to the right? Some perch too. Ah, oh, goodness. What a day, what a day. Something that I learned about the blacks and blues, I feel like they only eat when they're hungry or when there's a lot of competition. So you can see here, there's several blacks and blues and these are probably 18 inches long. These are good sized blacks and blue, blues, but 
either they're not hungry or there's just not enough competition for them to fight over a bait. So as I jig for him, one of these little black and yellows comes out and he, he's hungry. He's super opportunistic, so he'll take what he can get. Try to find more blacks and blues. They get a little thicker and thicker. And eventually I just start knocking them out the park. One black after another. Two blacks after another. This is a little school of blue rockfish. You can see they're interested, but I don't know if they see me, if they're just not hungry, or something about the presentation possibly is making them not bite. But now you can see they start to school up a little bit, and that's when I've noticed that they start biting, and they start competing with each other, trying to be the first to get a, to get the bait. See that lingcod come up from the top? This is what made me think that they were super spontaneous because he inspects the bait and he barely does anything to it. You know, I don't like he, it's he's smart. Like these fish, they're a lot smarter than people give him credit for. Like look at that. It's right in front of his face, but he, he doesn't care. Anyway, start catching a lot of blacks and blues. This is a blue rockfish. You can tell by the pattern underwater. They have a lot smaller mouths. Really fun to catch. And, you know, we could load up on blacks and blues if you did this underwater. And I'm still doing the same thing. I'm kind of jigging around the, the rocks and the crevices where I see a deep hole. There's a good chance that a big fish lurks beneath. But at the same time, the main target right now is blacks and blues. What would be really cool is if I took one of these blacks and blues and I had a live bait rig. Maybe if I caught a kelp greenling, drop a kelp greenling down and use that as a live bait rig. See see a lingcod come out and take it. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? What, what, what other suggestions do you guys have about this? What else can I do with this that might be cool? I mean, I could see this catching on. This could be a thing. Like, look at that. They're all chasing the, the bait now. So exciting when you're out there, especially on a calm, clear day. Like, bring a couple friends. Get out there. Do some snorkel fishing. It's so easy, too. Oh, I hooked a lingcod also, but he got away. It's a nice gopher rockfish. And yeah, it was just it was just fish after fish, just catch and release, catch and release, just weeding through them. And there's no need to to spear them and kill a small one if you don't want to. You can just hook them and release them. It's, a, it's honestly a really humane way to fish. This was a nice black rockfish. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. If I wanted to keep that one, totally could have. Hey, the jig jigs work. They'll get the blacks, they'll get the cabs, they'll get the blues. Definitely they'll get the black and yellows. But at this point, it started getting a little bit cold. Yeah, I've been out there for about three hours now. So this is the second to last fish. This was a, a good sized kelp greenling, probably a keeper. It would have been perfect for live bait. And then my camera started to malfunction a little bit. For some reason, it went into time-lapse mode. Man, what an epic day, y'all. This was crazy, man. It's so nice. I could still go out there and swim and fish. It's been about three hours. The sun is almost setting. I got pricked by one of those rockfish, and those are venomous, so my hand is a little throbbing right now. But that's the catch. That's a nice lingcod right there. Definitely a keeper. And that's going to be dinner. You saw it here first. Fisherman's life. Underwater snorkel fishing. Snorkel fishing, that's what we're calling it, right? <laughs> All right, y'all.